Well, praise the Lord, I want to welcome you once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. Here today being Saddleworth, England. And Bob Rizzoni, Pam, and Alice and I just are blessed to have you joining us wherever you are, whenever this is, uh, whenever you're seeing this. We're blessed by the technology that God has given us that we can share the word around the world. Proclaiming God's love. That's what we got to do. Yes. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing on in our study of the Sermon on the Mount. This is the 19th part of the Sermon on the Mount. And um, we're going to be talking today about prayer and Jesus' teaching on prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. But before we do that, I'd like to ask Bob if you would start us off with a prayer, Bob. Father, we just thank you. We just bless you. Yes. Father, we come together into your presence to receive your word into our hearts, Lord God. Father, transform us, Lord God, by the renewing of our minds through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Bring us revelation through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, we're continuing on. We're in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. The Sermon on the Mount that we're studying is from Matthew, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. <clears throat> and as we left off last week in the... Atlantic Ocean somewhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> we had just started to talk about prayer. In verse 5, when Jesus says, when you pray, um, and we talked about that quite a bit, so I, I want to continue on, and he says, when you pray, this is Matthew 6, 5, when you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So we, we had a good discussion, I think, last in our last session about prayer, being conversation with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So the purpose of prayer is to have a conversation with the Lord, not only to be heard by the Lord, but to, to hear what the Lord is saying to you. But he's saying that hypocrites, they... They like to be seen by men praying. Well, it's not a matter of being seen by men. It's a matter of being heard by the Father. That's what's important. So, you know, we, we tend to traditionalize prayer. And, and people, you know, I've heard people say, well, that person prays good. I don't really know what that means, that they pray good. Um, you know, maybe that means that they're really got the King James down pat or something. But it's not because of those kinds of words. Because remember, the Lord searches your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he wants to have this conversation, and we need to be trained in prayer. The Apostle Paul said in Romans that we don't know how to pray as we should. So, so here we have instruction on what prayer should look like. When you, go, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles. The Gentiles here, that's another word for like nations. That's the unsaved. That's, that's what that means. And the, the, the contrast between Gentiles in Scripture and in the Jewish world today is there is the family of God and those outside the family of God. And the Gentiles are those outside the family of God. It's not a matter whether you were born in Hoboken, New Jersey or in you know, uh, Tel Aviv, Israel. It's a matter of whether you were in or out of the family of God. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then Jesus says, pray then in this way, our Father. So this is what people around the world call the call prayer, the Our Father. This is Jesus' prayer, the Our Father. Well, the fact is, that's a contradiction in terms. This is not the prayer of Jesus. This is Jesus telling us what, we, what it should be our prayer. If you want to see Jesus pray, go to the uh, John chapter 17 and see how he prayed in the garden before he went to the cross. Mm -hmm. And 
And remember, Jesus is, without doubt, a man of prayer. We talked about in the beginning of this study, 19 weeks ago, how the Lord spent a night in prayer prior to bringing the Sermon on the Mount. Because he was receiving what he was about to give. Okay? And throughout his life, I mean, you can see, and you want to know something? This is where you see the power of God and the power of God in men and women. that are people of prayer. I love, for example, Elijah, who, who said he stands and he stood before God. You stand in the presence of God in this conversation with God. We're supposed to be, and we talked about this again last week, our prayer is supposed to be continual. It's ongoing. Paul says, pray without ceasing. ceasing. Right, exactly. So we need to come to that place where our conversation with the Lord is just a continual conversation, prayer. But this is not the Lord's prayer. This is our prayer. Uh, before, before we do that, we're going we're gonna to talk about the, this prayer. I have to tell you, back in the mid-70s, um, I was leader of a, a Catholic charismatic movement in upstate New York, on the Hudson River. And a Catholic church asked me if I would come in there and teach a group of teenagers this prayer. So I said, sure, I'd love to. And I came in, and within a week we had riots going on in the church. Um, because I was actually... Almost. I didn't, apparently, I didn't understand what they want. And I'm being facetious because I understood exactly what they wanted. What they wanted me to do was get these kids to memorize this prayer. And that's what they meant by teaching the prayer. So that they would have the memorization of these particular words. And when I started to teach these kids and say, okay, you know, here, let's get into what this means, what Jesus is saying, what he's trying to do in our lives. Well, that's not what they thought was going to happen, and that's not what they wanted to happen. And it got very, very exciting, very interesting, very quickly. Yes, it did. But unfortunately, that's what's happened in most of the church. We see this as a prayer that's said by rote. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't say, when you pray, pray these words. He said, when you pray, pray like this, pray this way. This is, a, this is not the prayer that we're supposed to repeat because Scripture makes it clear that God is not impressed when we pray things or talk to Him by rote. In other words, by memory. Just things we've memorized. This, but this is the way we should pray. So that's what we have to look at when we're doing this, all right? If you're praying something by memory, it's not coming from the heart. It's not coming from it's the heart. That's right, heart. exactly. It's coming from, it's coming from a, a, a memory cell in your brain. That's right. And it's not, con it's not going to connect with God's purpose in your life. Right? So, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven. Anybody see the oxymoron here? Anybody see a problem right off the bat? It's, it's a community prayer. It's a community prayer. Our. But wait a minute. He, he started by saying, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your Father who is in secret oh. and your Father who is in secret. It's almost like, okay, you go off, don't let other, don't get involved with other people when you're, you're praying here. You go off in secret and pray. And yet he says, here's the model. When you pray, pray this way, pray our Father. How does that work? Is, it, is prayer supposed to be something that we do on our own, or is it something we do in community? It's both. It's both. It's, I hear both, I hear both, and I, hear, I see a very questioning look over here in this corner. And in this corner... Contemplation. Any thought? Okay, it is an oxymoron. It's a paradox. Because the fact of the matter, it is both. It is either or, and it is both at the same time. And the reason for that is, we are first of all a community. For, well, first of all, we have an individual relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. So it's about having our Father. Having said that, even when you pray alone, we should have in, in our spirit a connection to the rest of the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. We should know that we are not alone. We should know that we are part of something greater than ourselves. We should know, because oftentimes when you pray, if you're going to go into prayer and you're not conscious of that, your prayer will be totally self-serving. Mm -hmm. But if you go in and you're conscious of the family, chances are good you'll be praying for other people and other parts of the family the chances are good that you'll be considering what's going on in the rest of the church as you begin to pray. Now, I don't know if you know this, but traditionally, the Jewish people for, for 
many centuries, many, 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 many centuries, have had this concept of what's called a minion. You guys know what yes. a minion is? A minion is, ten or more. pardon me? Ten or more, is it? Well, uh, ten. A minion, it, I think ten. minion is actually a Hebrew word for, for numbering, right? So, but they came from the concept that they didn't think that God heard individual prayer. Mm. Yeah, so you have to have, they hear the prayer. God hears the prayer of the nation. God hears, hears the prayer of his people, but not so much the prayer of an individual. So they came to the conclusion that you needed, and they, they arbitrarily, I don't know how arbitrarily, but the rabbis of old picked a number that required 10 adult men, by the way, 10 adult men, to be able to come together for a time of prayer to be heard by God. And that's very true today, still in Orthodox Judaism. And there are, there are areas, and it's funny because, you know, I, uh, in, in New York, there were, where I had some contact with Orthodox Jews, it was like they were, they were afraid on some days to walk around because you'd be grabbed off the street to become part of a minion. Yeah. Because there'd be yeah, nine guys that wanted to yeah. pray, and they couldn't. They could, yeah. So they'd just kind of grab somebody off the street, and that, that made up the minion. Well, there is power in us agreeing and being together in prayer. Jesus said later on here in Matthew, I think in Matthew 18, he said, if two of you agree touching anything, then your father, here, right? Mm -hmm. So there is that power in us connecting and praying, us praying to our father. And he said, where two or more of you are gathered in his name, there he is yes. in our midst. So now he's in our, he's in our presence right now. And does his presence change? Is there different presences, so to speak, of God? God, as it says, he inhabits the praise of his people. So he's present when people are praising. Well, he's a God that doesn't change, so his presence shouldn't change. No, well, no it is. You know, uh, again, not, I don't want to get, make a Catholic diatribe here or anything, but the Catholic Church talks about, quote-unquote, the real presence, mm -hmm. which they talk about being in, in the communion wafer that's been... Uh, blessed by by a priest. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there's no such thing as the real presence. There is either the presence or the lack of the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And we need the presence of God in our lives, right? Yes. But there is, apparently, otherwise Jesus wouldn't have said it, there is some greater strength in us as a body than there is in us as an individual. Right? This is not a new concept. It shouldn't be a new concept. It's not a New Testament concept. Think about the fact that it says way back in Ecclesiastes that two are better than one for their labor. Where the three stranded well, cord. That's the same verse. Right. A three stranded cord is not easily broken. Mm -hmm. So in our unity, there is greater strength. And not only that, in his prayer, the Lord's prayer, which would be in John 17 when he went into the garden, he said that we are perfected in unity. Yes. So yes. even when we're praying alone, we have to have this sense of unity. Mm -hmm. And when the church is functioning properly, in one mind, in one accord, don't you think that many of the things that you pray are being prayed by other Christians all yes. over the place? Yes. If it's not self-focused. Right. 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 If your prayer is not, okay, I want a new this kind of thing, or I want a new... But if your prayer is for the persecuted saints, if your prayer is for the return of Jesus Christ, right. if your prayer is for... You know, I want to tell you something. Lots. You are praying our Father because right. there are other people praying right. 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 Because our prayers are supposed to not be led by our, by well, obviously by our flesh or our own desires, mm -hmm. but our prayers are supposed to be led by the Spirit of God. For the right. Spirit of God, Paul says, right. teaches us how we should pray. Amen. And the part of the problem is, I know this to be the case in the West, the Western world, and I'm talking about particularly the European world, we have lost that sense of community. Mm -hmm. It goes back to family life. Uh, family life is broken down. We don't have that sense of community anymore. And it's true in the church. So many churches you go to today, people walk in, they'll spend an, uh, whatever, they spend half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour, two hours in a, in a building that they call a church. And that's their only association mm -hmm. with other people in the body. That's not community. In the early church, they were of one mind, one accord. They held all things in common. And interestingly enough, it says, both in chapter 2 and chapter 4 of the book of Acts, there was no need. It's interesting what your prayer life becomes when you're not focused on your own need. 
And that comes from the strength that we have in the unity that Christ has purchased for us. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, we tend to be... Uh, uh, I won't say that. I will say this. We have to be careful about being selfish or self-centered in our prayer life. We need to be conscious of the family of God and our place in the family of God, praying to our Father, not just my Father. I guess, unless anybody has any comments, I guess. That's why I want to say that. Our Father who is in heaven. Um, he is in heaven, by the way. Yeah, well, the Father is there. The Father's there. Okay? All right. And this is one of the things, and Bob and I uh, were having this conversation, I think we were all conversing about this the other day, is that oftentimes you see this separation within the body of Christ, not only in, the, in us, the people, mm -hmm. but you see we carry that separation into the Godhead, into yes. the person of God, right. where some churches ignore the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. some churches are totally focused on Jesus Christ, and don't get me wrong, and, you know, oftentimes, or there, there are people, God, the Father is God Almighty. Now, one of the big heresies in the church today, and it has been a big heresy in the church for, for decades, centuries, is that if you're a good, now listen to me, be prayerful about this. If you're a good Buddhist, well, that'll get you into heaven. If you're a good Muslim, that'll get you into heaven. No. If you're a good this or a good that, Listen, look at the structure. There is good order in God. God is not a God of confusion, right? He is a God of good order. Yes. No man... Back up one half step. Salvation is being reconciled to God the Father. This is what Christianity the, or is all about, is being reconciled to God the Father. We, we, our sin separated us from God the Father. His healing power for that was to send His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And that's to go, reconcile us to God the Father. Without Jesus, you can't get to the Father. Right. I'm going to tell you something right now. Without the Holy Spirit, you can't get to Jesus. That's right. Mm -hmm. You can't figure out how to get to Jesus on your own. It takes the leading and the drawing of the Holy Spirit in your life. There's not one of us who has come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ without the work of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. The yeah. Spirit leads you to Jesus. Jesus takes you to the Father. And they are inseparable. That is the highest command. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You cannot pick and choose what parts of God you want. And think how Jesus always pointed us to the Father. But so often, it's like the, the Father is absent in our lives because we are so focused on Jesus Christ. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not to be focused on Jesus because we're to fix our eyes on Him, right? That's right. This, again, is paradox. It's the mystery of all of this. But it's about the Father. Okay. It's all about Dad. It's all about Dad. Abba, Father. That's right. I mean... You know, we know that Jesus is our brother. But when it gets down to true community and family relationship, mm -hmm. it is that the Spirit of God within us cries Abba, Father. Cries, Abba, Father. All right? All right. Our Father who is in heaven, he's, by the way, he's not coming to earth. Now, there's, there's a major cult that calls itself Christian that teaches that the Father was a man like us and that we shall become like him and that he spent time on the earth. That's not true. Okay? He's in heaven. He's not coming to earth. He's going to send Jesus back to earth again to take this earth, to reclaim this earth, to reconcile, to fix it, by maybe by burning it all up. Ta -da. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. How many people know what hallowed means? It's holy. Seven. Well, it is. But I mean, how many, how many people do you think? How many people do you think have been taught to pray by rote? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. They haven't a clue what hallowed means. Like Halloween. Mm -hmm. 
I, this is, I remember I just mentioned, you know, I, really, when I, when I taught these teenage kids, the Our Father, it was like, okay, let's, let's learn this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And that's what I said. I stopped. Okay, what does hallowed mean? Not one of them had a clue. So why, why say the word if you don't know what it means? What, you know, what, how ridiculous and how ungodly is that? It is to sanctify the name of the Lord. It is to make, you know, we don't make his name holy. No. But we proclaim it as holy because we proclaim him holy, holy, holy. And it is. How far do you have to get into the commandments of God to hear about his name? In the beginning. Numero uno. Numero uno. His name. Think, we don't, we've lost sight in our culture about what names are. To us, it's just like, just a tag, you know. Yeah. Um, there was a time, and you'll find this in most Italian folk, where uh, it, typically your name would tell where you came from, for example. Mm -hmm. Other people in other cultures would tell what your heritage was, what, what your task was, what your oh, occupation okay. was. Right. But your name always told something about who and what you are. Mm -hmm. Now the Jews, if you go through the Bible, they have what they're called theophoric names. Mm -hmm. right? Because parents would name their children with attributes of what they wanted their the relationship of their children to be with God. It's all about relationship with God. Today, names have no meaning. But they, they always had certain power. It's like, if you walk down the street of London or New York City today and you say, hey, you, chances are good you're not, not a lot of people are going to pay attention to you. But if I walk down the street and I say, hey, Bob, I'm going to... Knowing your name has the power to grab your attention. Yes. Right? But knowing your name revealed something in, in scripture about who and what you who and what you are. Mm -hmm. yeah. Names were in, I can't begin to express the importance of names in scripture. But just as a hint, for example. Mm -hmm. God calls Moses, draws him. Remember, we come to the Lord because God draws us. We didn't find him. He found us. Right? So God draws Moses to him with a burning bush. And says to him that he's going to use Moses to go into the, into the land of Egypt, confront the Pharaoh, and set the people free. And this is a, this is a big paraphrase. Moses said, I ain't going. Unless I know your name. Why? Because they understood back then the power of a name. And we understood the power of that name. Now he said, I am that I am. God is the only one who can say that. I am that I am. In other words, you're, I am not because, I mean, I am not I am because I am. I am because of my mommy and daddy. I exist because of the actions of others. So do you. Each one of us human beings, we exist because of the activity or actions of somebody else. Mm -hmm. Only God and God alone exists because He exists. There's no, there's, there is nothing that caused God to exist. And He and He alone can say that. Now, there's so much controversy about that name. It's called a tetra, tetragram, tetragram. Forgive my lapse of memory here. It's four letters. Those letters are Y H W H. Y H W H. Well, the thing is, in ancient Hebrew, they didn't use vowels. The vowels were just known, right? So. Um, the, the typically accepted theologically pronunciation of the name is Yahweh. Right? And Moses would not do anything without having known that name. That is the name, I mean, this is the name of God Almighty. And right here we're saying, Jesus is saying when you pray, start your prayer by saying, blessed is your name. How can you, bless, how can you say your name is blessed when you don't know what the name is? As a, as a little aside, and I don't want to make this a big issue or anything, but for example, most evangelical Christians today translate that or speak that name as Jehovah. Mm -hmm. That, if I had a pen and paper, could demonstrate to you 
is just just from an error, literally. It's um, a, it's where a made up name. It, well, it's kind of a, yes, it is kind of a made up name, because what happened was because the Jews came to believe that the name was too holy to speak. And remember, they didn't have vowels, right? right? They would not speak the name. Today, religious Jews still absolutely will not say that name. What do they say? God. Or uh, they'll, they'll say Lord mm -hmm. or the Almighty, but they will not pronounce. It. Those, are, those are kind of more titles than they are his name. Mm -hmm. right? Even if you see religious Jews, when they write the word God, they won't even write that. They put G hyphen D right. for the same reason. It's too holy to, to use. So they would say Lord, for example. Replace, they would read scripture, they would come to the word Yahweh, and instead of saying Yahweh, they would say Lord. So in the ninth century, when the vowels were finally put in written in the Hebrew language, they were what they do is they put little dots below the, the Hebrew word to insert the vowels into the consonants. Okay, I hope I'm not making this too complicated, but I, I find it interesting. So what they did is when they came to the word Yahweh, they put in the vowels for the word Adonai, Lord. So you had the consonants for Yahweh, and you had the vowels for Lord. And since it was being translated and controlled by the Catholic Church, which had Latin, Latin does not have a Y. It had a J. So they substituted a J for the Y. And they thought that that was the pronunciation, and they came up with the word Jehovah. All right? That sounds silly. Well, I, I do have a, a certain difficulty with this mm -hmm. fact. And this has been such a, it's so incorporated. Absolutely. And and if it's not a real name, I mean, it's it's not a real scriptural name. They're praying to somebody. That's well. It's again, I, I find it searches the heart. There's there's something here, and you know I don't want to be legalistic and I don't want to be judgmental, but it troubles me. That, that God is saying his name is so holy. And I, not, only, not only can I use the example of um, Moses, but for example in Psalm 92, I think it is, it says, because you have known my name. Most people don't know God's name. I'm talking about the Father. They, they don't. I have a Bible here that I have been comfortable with for, for 35 years. It's a New American Standard Bible. And this Bible does not use the word Yahweh. Every place that they found the word Yahweh in the scriptures, mm -hmm. they substituted the word Lord, mm -hmm. as the Jews did way back then. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't understand a justification Why? for that. Re regardless of what anybody says, they've changed scripture. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what Yahweh says, wow. don't you do it. Mm -hmm. Don't you change the scriptures. So I, I don't want it, to, it's like if, I, if you use the word Yahweh today, even in you know a typical church, it's like people that's so strange to them that it becomes an issue, yeah. right? The problem is we're supposed to hold that name holy and reverent, and shouldn't we be using it? I mean, you know, why why have we taken it out of the scriptures? I I don't understand that. The other thing is. Based on all of this, one of the worst things that you can do is to take God's name in vain. To use it without it being holy in its usage. That was, that's what the, the Jewish people were afraid of, that it would be used wrong. Well, my goodness gracious, you can't go anywhere in the United States where you're hearing somebody using the name of Jesus Christ as a curse. Absolutely. That's awful. It is, it is. This is the name, the only name given by which men can be saved. It is the name above all names. It is the highest, the holy name, and yet it's used as a curse all over the place. How did we get to that place? We got to that place because we allowed the devil, Alien. we allowed the devil to take a little and a little and a little and a little. I happen to find it, I mean, it grates against my spirit when I hear that. It just grates against my spirit. Alice and I were in a restaurant one time, and we were sitting there, and there were four guys sitting at a table next to us. And this one guy just kept, he was like, oh, the whole meal, you know, I hear this guy, ah, oh, Jesus Christ, ah, oh, Jesus Christ, ah, oh, Jesus. 
And finally, I got up from my seat, and I walked over to him. I said, you, you mind if I ask you a question? He looked at me like, oh, what? And I said, I just wanted to know if you were cursing or praying every time you're saying Jesus Christ. Because if you're, if you're praying, I'd like to pray with you. I said, if you're cursing, I'd like to pray for you. And he just looked at me, and I went back and sat down. He didn't do it anymore, did he? No, he didn't. How do we get to that place, though, where that name has no sanctity, has no holiness in our use? How do we get to that place where we just abandon the name of the Father because for some reason it doesn't suit well or sit well or, you know, it's just not, it's, it's not comfortable for us? Mm. The name of God is holy. It is to be sanctified in our lives. And Jesus is saying, when you pray, that's how you start. By, by sanctifying, by saying, thy name is holy. Your name is, you know. We, how, how frequently do you find yourself blessing the name of the Lord? We sing the song, I will bless the Lord, I will bless the name of the Lord. But how often do we actually do it in, in our lives? It is the entrance to prayer. Now, if you have a father, a natural father, all right, and you go to him and you say, Daddy, you, you say, Pop, you say, Father, well, he's going to respond to all of those things. But if you go to that, that man that is your natural father and call him Ralph, and his name happens to be John, I don't know how that works. <laughs> And if were you to use that name in a derogatory way, I think that would be very painful to your father. Sure. I, I think I think that I can't sit here today and tell you how to reverence that name. But I think I can legitimately sit here today and say we need to contemplate that and think about how we use or misuse, or disuse, or not use the name of the Lord. Because Jesus said, when you pray, here's how you start. Yeah, for sure. All right. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, not very far along here, Jesus will say, no man can serve two masters. No one can serve two masters. For either, I'm in verse 24 of the same chapter we're in, right? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other. He will be devoted to one and despise the other. You know, the Word of God also says we're responsible for every careless word that comes out of our mouths. Right? You're responsible. You let a word out of your mouth, you're responsible for that word. You say this, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. One of the things that you are saying you may not realize this is not my will. Right. Remember how Jesus, I said, this is not the Lord's Prayer. This is our prayer. Look at the Lord's Prayer. He said, but not my will be done, thy will. Isn't that what he prayed? Yes. Jesus practiced what he preaches here, right? Yeah. He practiced what he teaches. One of the things, most of the times, I, I, I say this too casually and too often. Oftentimes, when we go into prayer, what we're trying to accomplish is to get our will done. Yes. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. I mean, it's like, okay, we're going to give God instruction on what we want done and how we want it done. Yep. That's the prayer life of a lot of people. Yep. So Jesus said, okay, when you pray, let's get this straight. Your will be done. Because it can't be two masters. It's going to either be your will or his will. And if you're praying your will, you are not praying effectively. And it says, the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. A lot of people are praying ineffective prayers. And you might recognize that when your prayers aren't answered, when you feel like your prayers get about that high over your head and collapse on top of you. We need to come to that place. How do you find out what his will is? The word. This reveals what his will is. We are, that's why we have, it says, if you, this is a confidence we have. We know that if we pray anything, we ask anything in His will. So how do you know it's in His will? This is it. And if you don't know the Word of God, if you don't know who He is, what He is, if you haven't read the, the history of man and God in Scripture, you're not going to know what His will is. But it's you, you recognize, I'm sure you, as I 
as I sit here and you sit there, I'm sure you recognize the truth of what I'm saying. So often, prayer is about us going to God to get our will done. Absolutely. And Jesus said, when you're going to, before, before you ask anything, this is what you got This is the, the model for prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. When he says on earth, is he talking about down the block? When he talks about on earth, is he talking, oh, we want them over in Iran to change their ways. We want them over in North Korea to change. You know what? He's talking to you. He's talking about his will needs to be done right in you. That's where it's got to start. You can't control the North Koreans. You can't control the Iranians or the Iraqians or the Afghanistanis or the Hobokians or the Californians. You only have... Self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Self-control. You can't. It's not about you controlling others. It's about you choosing to use control what you do. So His will, when you pray this, it's got to start in you. Not my will, but Thy will be done. Okay. Finally, verse eleven, we get to the us part. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, Scripture makes it pretty clear that bread is a necessary, because that's representative of just food. Paul, the Apostle Paul says, that if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. you got to have food. Yes. Although, Jesus once also said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, you know, it's you got to have both. You have to have that natural food, and you have to have that spiritual food. But... If food is the basic, then all we need to go to God and ask for is the basic. Mm -hmm. The thing we need. There's nothing in here, and he says this is a model for prayer, about what we want. This is a need. Mm -hmm. And the promise of God, Paul says this in Philippians, my God shall supply all of your needs mm -hmm. through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You have every right to have an absolute assurance in your prayer life, in your life life, that God will meet your needs. He'll give you that daily bread that you need, the thing that you need. He already knows what we need. But how much time do we spend asking for the things that we want? Not now, we when you come into a right relationship with our Father, you understand that He wants the things that bless you in your life. Yes. He wants to give good things to you. Yes. After all, if, if, if he did not withhold his only son, what good thing what, would what he withhold would from he you? Possibly withhold. Right? And if he's promised to meet all of your needs, not just some of them, then what's your problem? Right. Our prayer life does not need to be, should not be, self just a self-focused going to get stuff from God. Who does that? Silly little immature children. Mm -hmm. Always running to, to mommy or daddy saying, give me, give me, give me. I want, I want, I want. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to be mature. We're supposed to be growing into maturity in the Lord. So what that does when you realize is it doesn't take away your ability to have what you ought to have. What it does is it frees you from the bondage of wants. Yes. That that you have, you know, you saw the local advert, you saw a billboard on the way to there, here, or there, and now all of a sudden you, 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 you are in bondage to these things that you want. Advertising works. Now, I always use the example, think about what these corporations pay to have 30 seconds into your brain, for example, on the Super Bowl. They will spend millions upon millions upon millions of dollars to produce a 30-second spot, to air that 30 second spot because they are utterly convinced based on experience that if they can get 30 seconds in your brain they can change you. Mm -hmm. yes. They know that. So what God is saying here, what Jesus is saying to us, we don't need to do that. We, we're, we're free from that bondage. Whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. We're supposed to be free from that gimme, 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 gimme. The leech has three daughters, it says. Give me, give me, give me. All right? So, but you can go and say, Lord, you know, 
Give me my daily bread. That's all. That's all I need, Lord. That's all. That's all I need to, you know, to ask for. Okay. Now, verse twelve. Let's go to verse twelve. Those of you who highlight your Bibles, you might really want to highlight this verse. And I, I will give you the option. You might use your yellow marker or your pink marker. Some point? of you want to consider using a black, black permanent marker to highlight this particular verse. Because this is one of the most dangerous verses in the Bible. Jesus Christ is saying, when you pray, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go before your Father, and I want you to say, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. To go before the Father and say, Father, I want you to forgive me the same way I forgive others. Really? Do, could you, can you, now this is a prayer that people say by rote thousands of times. You understand what you're praying. You're asking God, forgive me the same way I forgive some other people. And you don't think that's dangerous? It's dangerous if you are not. By the power of the yeah. Holy Spirit, by the love of God that's been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit, if you are not forgiving. How important is it for us to forgive? It's that important. Okay, absolutely. So what happens if your prayer life doesn't include this reality? If To bring this into, as you're talking to your Father, to bring this into your consciousness that I need to have that same heart of God the Father that I forgive. Now, particularly when it comes to brothers and sisters, how can you have unity to go before God and say, Our Father, if you have been divided by unforgiveness from another part of the body? Yeah. Oh, for sure. The answer is you can't. Yeah. You can't. And division, this is why Paul says, let there be no division among you. I'll go back and I'll talk one more time about the Lord's Prayer. Not this, but the Lord's Prayer. Because in John 17, when Jesus Christ is facing the cross, he knows this is the end of it all. What does he go into the garden and pray for? That we might be one, even as he and the Father are one. He prays for our unity. And he says, we are perfected in that unity. And yet what you see in the church today is division, unforgiveness, bitterness. It is the most destructive tool of the devil. And it is abundant out there in the body of Christ. How can we pray our Father? This is Christianity. I've been saying that for 19 weeks now. The Sermon on the Mount is not just a model of prayer. It is the model of what Christianity is. And we were made in God's image. This is the very beginning. Go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created. How did he create us? He created us in his image. What has he shown us? Christ hung on a cross, looked at the people that had mocked him, beaten him, whipped him, just done every evil thing you can think, and he looks at them and says, Father, forgive them. We're made in his image. If we don't have that kind of forgiveness, we are not living Christianity. We are not walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. This prayer is serious, serious stuff. Because I, if I started by just saying, we know that, hey, prayer is important. What? Prayer is, that's, that's like saying air is important. You know, take the air away. Where are you? You're going to be flopping around like a fish on the, out of water. Without prayer, without this right relationship with God the Father, you're spiritually, you're like a fish flopping around out of water. But meanwhile, you're not going to have a vital prayer life. You're not going to have a prayer life while there is yet bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart towards anybody else, right? And that doesn't mean just Christians. It means... Anybody. No, it means everybody. But, you know, how, are you, how can I possibly think anybody could be expected to forgive the unrighteous, unsaved people out there, if you can't forgive people that you know that God has forgiven. Right, right. Um, in my translation, which is the New King James, it says, forgive us our debts. Yeah, debts. Right. Wow. Yeah, okay. we have debts too. Um, in one of the other translations, it says, forgive us our trespasses. Right. Okay. And for me, that is a clearer 
line. It is yes, exactly. It's offensive. Right. Then, eh, so the guy owes me something, or somebody owes me something, and that'll be a trespass. When somebody trespasses, that yeah. covers okay. a broad I'm glad you brought yeah. that up because he's certainly not talking about the guy that lent me five oh, bucks. Exactly. Uh, so I forgive him at five bucks. Yeah, right, right, right. yeah because, because after all, the word also says, owe oh, nothing to any man but right. love. Which covers right. that. Right. Exactly. And yeah. if you have offended, if you've done something wrong to a brother, you owe, that is a debt that you owe. Right. Uh, you know, this is why this, that is a good translation other than the fact that we don't understand. Right. It. No, 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 I got it. That, yeah. that you have an obligation to love. It's not just, it's just not just a nice thing, oh, what a nice Christian that person is mm -hmm. because you love somebody. It is your obligation to love them. I mean, this is when God, it says from whom much has been given, much is required. To To, yeah, what did I say, from? I, 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 my pronouns. Forgive me, English. Forgive me my pronouns. She's okay. getting English and American English mixed right. up. But, but the fact is that that's absolutely true. If, if God has poured his love into our hearts, then that love is required of us by God. Because we've been given much, much is required. That's, it's, it's like, is it a debt? Well, I don't like to think of it as a term, but in fact it is. Yeah. It is. You owe this to God. It says, owe nothing to any man but love. Therefore, you owe love. Absolutely. It's not, and if you owe something, it's not like you're doing a favor when you pay it back. No. no. You know, it's not, you can't go boasting about the fact, you know, I, I owe somebody $5 and I, I paid them back. Oh, Boy, yeah, what right. a hero I am. <laughs> well, but we have to give that love of God because we're obligated to give it. But it's, it's not, that's not supposed to be a burden. It shouldn't be a burden to do that. So when you stop, um, and when you've, when you've loved everybody, then your debt's done. <laughs> yes. As soon as you've loved everybody perfectly and completely, you got it. You got it covered, baby. That's it. That's it. Um, wow. I, I expect to achieve that any right now. Yes, it so. will. <laughs> but that's that's one of the joyful things, you know, because we know that's what awaits us. The imperfect will, you know, be put yeah, off, and, and we will have the perfect. It says when the perfect comes, that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, we're going to be perfected in Him. Um, God is in the process of perfecting us. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago because He's Jesus perfect. said, "Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect." It, and it's it, it's not so much the achieving of that as it is the desiring of that and and working towards it. And it's not our human nature to do this, so we need to we need to learn these things. Paul says in Romans, Romans chapter twelve, that we need to not be conformed to the world. The world doesn't do this. It's not just that the world doesn't do it. The world absolutely can't do this. They don't have the power to do that. You know, I, 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 I would venture to say the church doesn't do this, unfortunately. Yes. You're right. Yes. You're absolutely that's right. Sad to say. And that's why, that's why if, if it were not, this is the time for the church to repent. Yes. This is not the time for the church to stand up and boast in what it's accomplishing. This is a time for the church to repent for what we have failed to accomplish. Because Jesus and God the Father are not looking for our pretty buildings. Yeah. They are not looking for this. And what they are looking for is the hearts of men filled and men reconciled. And I, and I use that generically for all of you people out there. When I say men, I mean men, women, children. Let me ask a question. Something occurred to me. When do we fulfill the debt of love? Well... I would say each and every time, and I mean it's never fulfilled because it's not. I'm going. Yeah. We will never. No. Until we that. get to heaven. So if we owe nothing to any man but love, that's something that we owe all, all the time. All the time. Yes. All the time. All the time. All it's the time. an on, an ongoing all thing. The time. It's like that. What forgiving somebody? How many times? Back. How many times do I have to forgive them? Right. One more time. One, one more time. time. One, one more time. time. And, and the the problem is, them. and yeah. this has to do with our failure to do that, and with the division in the body of Christ is that we take offense. Yes. And offense is a focus on self that says, you hurt me. Who cares? Because you want to know something, Paul wrote in Second in First Corinthians, and he says, love does not take into account a wrong, a wrong suffered. suffered. Yeah. And if that's God's love, that it doesn't take into account a wrong suffered, you you are not allowed to get offended. Yeah. I, you know, I know I've shared this before a lot of times. But as a matter of fact, we're in England right now, 
And uh, last year we were here, and I was down in Oxford. Or it was neither in Oxford or London, I don't remember. And this woman came to me, and she said that she had just come from a conference, and they were talking about how do you deal with all these people that, that offend you? Because I'll tell you, nobody, people are doing you wrong out there. They're doing you wrong. Absolutely. That's the world we live in, and it's getting worse. So she said, you know, how do we deal with people when they offend us? And I said, well, what do we do? She said, what do we do? What do I do when somebody See, offends repent. me? I said, repent. And I'm telling you, she went into shock. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. What do you mean I should repent when somebody offends me? I didn't me? do anything. I didn't do anything. Well, the fact of the matter is, this has to do with dying to self. Yes. Then people can't get offended. Right. So you there's know? still too much of us there if we get offended. Absolutely. So what we, what we need to do is focus on that other person. Yes. Because love does not take into account our wrong suffering. You have to forgive them. Yes. That forgiving them, it's not a feeling. It's a choice. Yes. Yeah, but he's already laid the foundation for this verse over in in five um, five twenty three twenty four through there. Um, yeah, but I say to you, everyone who is angry with his yes. brother right. will be guilty before the court. Absolutely. Right. So get rid of the anger. How do you get rid of the other by forgiveness? Right. right. You know, it, it's, it's really cool. I've been saying this. You know, the Sermon on the Mount, it starts with the Beatitudes, and everything else is kind of like commentary, right, right. and it builds and builds and yes. builds. And right. it's just, it's such a, it's a beautiful thing when you see the order of this, right. how it continues to build. This training in righteousness, Absolutely. that's what it is. Right? So, but that's a, we need to get to that place where we take it seriously, that when we're praying according to the way that he taught us to pray, that we have to have a heart that says, Lord, forgive me the way I forgive others. So we are learning how to forgive. And that, like I said, that in the natural, that doesn't come easy. You know, you can see Peter who thought he was really doing cool mm -hmm. when he could forgive somebody seven times. Mm. Yeah, right. And Jesus said, yeah, well, try seven times 70. Right. Mm. You know, it's, you, you don't get to that place where it's over. You, you, that's what Bob was saying. You know, we have to learn how to out of love. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was saying something else I forgot. Okay. Well, I, I, all right. And in verse 13 it says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Well, the fact of the matter is God can lead us into very, very difficult places, very hard places. That's evident in Scripture from the beginning. You know, he gave Joseph a vision amongst his brothers, how Joseph would be exalted. And then the next thing that happens is brothers throw him down a well. <laughs> how much fun is this? How much fun is this? Back the opposite. Yeah. And then, they, then yeah, he's not, you know, his vision is that they're, they're going to be bowing before him. And the next thing is they're throwing he's him down a well. He's looking up at them. Right, yeah. exactly. There you go. And it, it mentioned Moses. When God used Moses to bring the people out of the Red Sea. It was God that hardened the heart of Pharaoh. It was God that led them directly to the Red Sea. It was God who built the Red Sea. He spoke that into existence. Yes. That entire situation is the leading of the Lord. And it says he leads us in paths of righteousness for Very his easy. name's sake. So God will lead us into those places. Why? Why? So because we'll be glorified. Before, well, you know, that's how this prayer ends, and we'll get to that. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. It's all about the glory of God. It is all about the demonstration of God. It is all about blessing His that His name it's would be exalted. Him. It is all about Him. Yes. You might God bless you. you. Might have sneeze. Okay, thank you. God bless you. God bless me. Are you praying for me? Okay. So He doesn't. God, we are tested by events. Yes. yes. Over and over and over. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you Amen. for your testing. That's right. The afflictions, many of the afflictions of the righteous. Yes. But the purpose of testing, and God does test us. Yes. Job said, I know that when I have been tried, I shall come forth as fine gold. Amen. Testing looks for impurity and removes the purpose is to remove the impurity. The purpose is not condemnation. No, no. How much more clear could Paul make that in Romans chapter yeah, 7 and 8? And when he says, therefore, there's therefore now no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. Right. right? It's not about condemnation. It's not about judgment. But it is about removing the impurities continually. Why? Because his glorious promise says that he is transforming us and bringing us from glory to glory. Mm -hmm. We have been predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus, to get back to that place 
where it started when he made us in his image. And, there, you know, there's only one reason you don't look like Jesus. Because of the imperfection in your life. So God keeping, watching over his word to perform it, keeping his glory, his promise, is taking the imperfections out of you. And one of the things about this testing is that the process is, and I'm not by any means a metalsmith or anything, but my understanding is, like with gold, they heat the gold. They heat it to unbelievably, right? Hot. Hot, hot, hot. And what happens is the impurities float to the surface where they can be scraped off. I can remember times in my life when I recognized you know, things in my life that I didn't want in my life, or I'm sure God didn't want in my life. So I prayed, Lord, get this out of my life. And the next thing I know, it was worse than ever. I you know what I mean? Yeah, so I you know the reason for that? He was crying me, and the imperfections were coming to the surface. Only your prayer. Where he could scrape them off. I just had this neat thought that when we're talking about Jesus reconciling us to the Father, and he is the potter, and we are the clay, and he's making these vessels, he's, and he's going to present this vessel to the Father. So he's putting it on the wheel, and he's constantly putting it, perfecting it, making perfecting it. Yes. And when he gets it right, and it's perfect, then he can present us to the Father. But in the meantime, we're constantly, he's, he he's, he's changing us, because, nope, this is not good enough for my Father. Well, you know, and the thing is, we're resistant to change. Yes. We were talking about this the other day. Because change is the enemy of comfort. Yes. You get comfortable where you are and you don't like things change. But God's purpose in our life is to change us. To bring us from glory to glory. To transform us and conform us into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. So we have to be willing to get past that desire for comfort and say, Oh Lord, change me. Cleanse my heart, oh Lord. Create me a clean heart. Create me a clean heart. You're praying for change. Yes. Yes. Then you know you're praying according to the will of God, right? You're praying according to the when you can say, not my will, but thy will be done. You know that you're praying according to the will of God. And when you do that, you have confidence. You know what? You're going to have a great prayer life because you're going to see your prayers answered. Mm. When you start praying the things that you and the Lord both know are the things you should be praying for. Mm. And the other thing is, when you're praying in community. That's why... You know, Paul said we need to be praying one for another. We, we do need to be praying for one another. So we get to this place where people are praying. And they're not praying that you're going to, you know, have enough hot dogs to eat. They are praying that that person will look more like Jesus Christ. That people will see the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. We, our ministry, being a ministry of reconciliation, Paul says... We are a fragrant aroma, bringing knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus into every place. Yes. Our ministry is to bring the Word of God, the power of God, the love of God into every place that we go. Mm -hmm. And you want to know something? That's not going to be comfortable. Mm -hmm. Because the world basically mm -hmm. doesn't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. But that goes back to the thing. It may, this may not be their want, mm -hmm. but I promise you it's their need. And God will meet mm -hmm. their needs. They need to hear the word of God. Amen. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how shall they call upon him? They must save. Amen. So. Okay. God doesn't lead us into temptation. Testing is not cause to fail. Temptation, the purpose of temptation, the devil tempts us because he wants us to fail. God tests us because he wants us Perfecting. Yes, amen. Okay? Deliver us from evil. I just want to say, God delivers us from evil. He, he absolutely yes. delivers us yes. from evil. Yes. He is a deliverer. Above all, we should know that He is our deliverer. Mm -hmm. He didn't just deliver us from the bondage of sin and set us free. He continually delivers us. He's a fortress. I'll just close by saying this. This a couple of days ago, or a day ago, I lose track of time. Uh, we were over in North Wales, mm -hmm. and we had the opportunity to see some beautiful castles on the way to, going into North Wales. And we stopped at a village called Conwy, which is a, a fortress. That was a place where you, you, know, you could go and rush into this fortress. Well, that's the way we should do. We should rush into the presence of God because he delivers us. Mm -hmm. All right? They're from the enemy. So, hallelujah, Father, we just we thank you now, Lord thank God. You, Jesus. We do. We bless your holy name, Lord God. We glorify your name. Amen. And we thank you, Lord God, 
that, that we know, we have this confidence that you will meet all of the needs that we have, even because you know what we need before we have a yes. clue what we need, before we ask, before we can think them. But I pray that we have that heart of forgiveness that you have, that Jesus demonstrated, that people might see your love in and through our lives. I pray above all, God, that you would use our lives for the glory of your name. In Jesus' precious name. Well, until the next time, it's been a blessing to be with you. And uh, we just, that's our, our prayer. God, you can do it.